afternoon, depending on where you are uh, in the world. Uh, welcome to this webinar with uh, Dave Anderson. I'm obviously not Dave Anderson, but uh, I'll make a quick introduction of the speaker here uh, to uh, today. Uh, just before we go uh, to the presentation and uh, the follow-up Q&A, just a few logistical items. Uh, we are almost 200 registered participants uh, today, and we use uh, Microsoft uh, Teams where everybody is muted by, by default. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't ask questions, so just make sure to ask those questions in the uh, Q&A chat box to, uh, to the right. The uh, presentation is estimated to be around 40 to 45 minutes, and then we have a, a Q&A session uh, after. And then uh, it's also important to emphasize that the uh, the meeting will be uh, or is recorded. Uh, the recording will be available on Whitson Academy, which is our online learning uh, platform. Uh, and we've already made our live public courses available for 2023 uh, that those you can find online at uh, witson.com slash training. And that includes both uh, theoretical courses and the Whitson Plus uh, software courses. Uh, so on that note, I'm very happy to introduce the, the speaker, uh, Dave uh, Anderson. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from University of Calgary, uh, probably very known among uh, at least uh, my community as uh, the VP of software development in Fiquette for more than 50, 15 years. Uh, he is now working as the CEO and one of the founders at Saga Wisdom, which is a online learning a learning platform towards uh, energy uh, companies. He's uh, definitely a recognized authority in RTA and was also an SBE distinguished lecturer in 2014. Most importantly for me is that he is also a great guy. So if you ever met uh, Dave, it's very hard uh, not uh, not uh, not to like him. Uh, so with that, Dave, I will uh, stop presenting and give you uh, the speaker rights. Thanks, Matthias. Everybody see? Yep. Everybody see? Perfect. Awesome. Um, I want to I want to thank Matthias and the Whitson crew for inviting me to present today. Uh, this is a talk that um, I've been wanting to put together for a long time, and I'm glad I finally got the chance to to do it. Um, hopefully, you guys will get some value out of this. This is sort of a historical perspective. Um, I did a lot of digging <laughs> to get a lot of material from the past. And uh, it'll be interesting to go through it together. Um, I want to start with just you know a definition. I'm I'm going to assume that most of the people on the call are familiar with rate transient analysis. I was perusing the list a little bit, and I recognize some of the names. So I know that you folks are are practicing some of these technologies already. But I just wanted to start by pointing out and reminding everybody that RTA at its base is very very simple and straightforward. It's, it's really the recognition that we need to use production rates and flowing pressures together, and you can put it on whatever time scale you want. Typically, we do this on a daily basis. My graph there, I'm showing it as, a, as time in months. It doesn't really matter as long as you measure the rate and the flowing pressure together. You do what's called instantaneous normalization, so you simply put the rate and the flowing pressure together in a, in a, in a normalized, um, function Q over delta P, and then we use a superposition time uh, called material balance time, which is, again, very, very simple to do. It's just cumulative production divided by rate. Um, anybody can do this just in an Excel spreadsheet. Heck, you can do it on the back of a napkin if you want. The, the setup of the data in order to do rate transient analysis, dead simple. And you're 90% of the, of the battle once, you, once you've done that, and then you can sort of apply that going forward. So with that as our stage to set, um, I, when I was contemplating putting this together, you know, one of the things that I thought about is when I started my career in 1996, you know, what was it that reservoir engineers were doing? And, and I was lucky I, I worked at a really good consulting company called the Ket Associates. And we had, you know, this sort of distribution of tasks. There was a lot of reservoir engineers working at the Ket, and we had people doing reserves interpretation, we had people doing well test analysis, we had people doing reservoir simulation, and we had people doing nodal analysis type projects, you know, pipeline projects where we were figuring out um, surface capacity in relationship to subsurface uh, requirements. 
So there was sort of an equal distribution of tasks that reservoir engineers would undertake. If we fast forward to 2023, um, the major, and I don't think I'm exaggerating, but the major change in sort of distribution of work, what people are doing has been RTA. Um, it has taken up, I, and I would say, if not 50%, very close to 50% <clears throat> of all of this work that we used to do. In fact, it has completely taken over PTA, and I'm, I want to stress that this is onshore North America. I realize that hasn't been the case, you know, overseas. We're doing offshore type um, uh, uh, reservoir engineering. There's still a lot of conventional flow and buildup test analysis done. But in onshore North America, it's it's hard to understate how much, you know, PTA as a conventional PTA has just gone away. Uh, when I started my career, we had a well test group that had 15 people in it, and the government of Alberta required an initial flow and build up test to be done on every single well that was drilled. And that's just, that doesn't exist anymore. So RTA has sort of taken that task over. Material balance, there was material balance studies where you would, uh, you know, we had engineers that did, they spent all of their time doing material balance analysis. That's, again, that's not done anymore, and so on and so on. And RTA has even taken over some of what decline curve analysis, there's still obviously a lot of decline curve analysis done, but some of what, what that used to be um, pointed towards is now taken over by RTA. Same, same thing with uh, reservoir simulation. Now that we have these very uh, um, efficient, practical and accurate uh, single well history match models, you know, we can do a lot of that with rate transient analysis. So it's very interesting to see this sort of development over the past 25 years where this new science, this new sort of um, practitioner technology has come into being. And so what I'd like to do is really sort of try and tell the story of RTA from my perspective. Um, I was kind of in the middle of the, the um, revolution, if you want to call it, that, that made uh, uh, RTA sort of ubiquitous in the industry in, in the sense of uh, uh, the software development. And I also did a lot of the um, production analysis myself to road test some of the methodologies that were out there. So what I want to do is, is identify some of the milestones, tell a little bit of the story. Hopefully that it's it's interesting. <laughs> I tried to leave out the boring bits and, and show what are kind of the cool things that really transformed how we how we look at production data. And uh, and one thing I'm not going to do is predict the future. I learned early on in my career not to try and be very specific about future predictions. I mean, who could have predicted what happened between 2010 and 2020 with with the with the way unconventional sort of took over? Um, I don't think anybody could have thought that we'd be doing production analysis the way that we're doing it now. So what I will do is offer a few insights. Hopefully that I you know I think will um, be interesting as to what what we might expect going forward. Okay, so in order to sort of understand how RTA came into being and where we might be going in the future. I want to set the stage with kind of an early timeline of reservoir engineering milestones. Most of these happened in the decades between 1950 and 1980. This is where all the sort of heavy lifting was done. And um, I'm going to give you sort of three tracks. Anybody that's taken my course has sort of seen this sort of exercise. Um, we can think of decline curve analysis and well testing as as the parents of of RTA. RTA is going to be their their strange child that's going to appear in the early 1980s, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. And then reservoir, and reservoir simulation is also a contributor, maybe a long lost cousin or something. But these are the three timelines very much separated during the decades of 1950 to 1980. With decline curve analysis, of course, we had the main paper that was written by J.J. Arps way back in the late 1940s. And really nothing, nothing very much scientific has happened since then. But as far as practitioner and utility, decline curve analysis absolutely eclipses everything else. I mean, it's the main tool that petroleum engineers use. Um, completely the opposite on the well, well testing side, all the innovations that have happened in reservoir engineering basically have happened on the well testing time track, but it's a very, it represents a very small sliver of utility. So it's sort of interesting, the dynamics there. Well, the the well testing track really owes everything to the diffusivity equation. Now, the diffusivity equation is really the 
sort of the fundamental starting point of reservoir engineering. All of that was solved by Muscat and some of his collaborators and, and, and based on previous work before 1950. So fluid flow problems in reservoir engineering were, were well known and all basically solved. Um, but one of the sort of seminal events that are really important for the development of reservoir engineering was work that Van Everding and Hearst did in 1949, which was basically solving uh, <clears throat> the diffusivity equation in Laplace space, which allowed the inclusion of storage and skin effects. And that made it practical as a tool to be used for well testing uh, and pressure buildup analysis. So this was a really, really important event, probably the single most important event that allowed everything you know, to happen from there in terms of advancement. And the advancements that we got out of that were, were you know, I could spend all day talking about those. We'll just sort of try and hit the highlights. Pressure buildup, storage and skin, all the straight line analysis method, methods, um, reservoir limits testing, uh, type curve analysis. And then in the 1960s, we had all of the advancements that allowed gas well testing, such as pseudo pressure. And I'm not going to name all the names. There's tons of them. You guys are probably familiar with them. Um, but we've got an extensive list of, of papers that are good reading material if you want to sort of learn about the history of all this stuff. So these were obviously very important advancements that occurred. And then on the reservoir simulation track, there is a branch here. OK, we have the diffusivity equation that was solved by finite difference uh, equations um, for reservoir simulation rather than analytical solutions. And then we go forward from there. Interestingly, nothing much happened in reservoir simulation early on because we because you didn't have the computing power to, to do it. But practical reservoir simulation becomes its own uh, discipline and lots of innovations were done there by Coates and, and uh, other uh, authors after about 1960s and 1970s. So these will all be contributors to what we now call RTA. Um, all right, so the uh, RTA, I'm going to say RTA was born in 1980. I was trying to figure out, you know, when was the first time rate transient analysis was really mentioned in the literature. And interestingly, it was mentioned in 1980, not by Fetkevich, but Fetkevich really gets the honor of having the, the, the paper that really makes RTA come into being. Without uh, Fetkevich's insights, none of this, I don't think, would, would ever have happened. So, so Mike Fetkevich, who was a petroleum engineer at Phillips Petroleum, really gets the accolade, as far as I'm concerned, of, of being the inventor of RTA, even though he didn't say it as such. He never, I don't think he ever used the term RTA, interestingly enough. But uh, he was the one that had the foresight to say, OK, we've got all of this production data and we're doing decline curve analysis on it, which is not terribly scientific. And then on this other track, we have all of these advancements, these tremendous advancements in reservoir engineering that we're doing a tiny, you know, doing these little expensive transient tests, pressure buildups. Why don't we bring these together? Why don't we bring the science that well testing has given us and apply it to all of this data that's ubiquitous and allow us to get much more mileage out of the data that's out there. He had that recognition, which is really, really cool. I don't think anybody had really done that before, or certainly they hadn't published a paper that, that showed that that could be possible. So Fekovic gets credit for that. Um, later on, we had some other contributors uh, that solved two major problems, and I'm going to go into a little more detail on those in a minute. One was the problem of reconciling the gas material balance with the production equations. And the other one was the recognition of the equivalency between constant rate and constant pressure. And, uh, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, the other big contributor on the well test analysis uh, perspective was derivative analysis. Uh, that is still considered to be the single biggest advancement in pressure transient analysis, uh, theory, technology, practitioner, science over the past 50 years. So that was huge. And that was, that was uh, done by Bourdais in the late 1980s and allowed a much better visualization of flow regimes and a sort of qualitative analysis that allowed analysts to really understand what was going on with the data. So that's an important contributor to RTA as well. About the time I started my career was, was really where some of these things all came together. So there were three things that needed to happen in order for RTA really to become a useful utilitarian tool that the average engineer could use. One was we had to have practi practical history match models, which we got from reservoir simulation. Uh, one was we had to have uh, widely available commercial software. So there had to be software that allowed people to, to, to do this sort of work. And that started to be, those started to be developed, developed in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And most importantly was the availabil availability of flowing pressure, which prior to the 1990s didn't exist. Okay. 
Um, and so you can't blame Fetkevich for not incorporating flowing pressure. He just didn't have access to it. It wasn't available. So the flowing pressure really uh, made it possible. The availability of the software um, really set the stage and allowed this to become uh, a big deal. Um, so we did conventional RTA for those first few years. And then, of course, everything changed in around 2010 when unconventionals became a big thing. And that really changed the paradigm again. So I'm going to go through this, some of these milestones. Um, and at the end, we'll talk about integrated RTA models. That's when we started to include hydraulic fracture modeling um, and uh, uh, surveillance models and things like that into the into the mix. And RTA really became a tool that was providing a framework for a multidisciplinary team. So that's kind of what I'm going to try and cover. Um, so let's uh, let's kind of start with the beginning. I I, I want to give Fetkovich his due because because this is really uh, extremely innovative stuff. And a lot like I think about it and like this guy was probably 20 years ahead of his time. He really was because he was solving problems that like the industry didn't even really recognize. They and, and when I say pro I don't mean like theoretical problems. I mean practical problems that the ability to take, you know, all of this knowledge that was in this tiny little sliver of specialization and roll it out to a large scale production platform was huge. So let me talk a little bit about some of the advancements that he made. And uh, we'll just do a quick little video here. You know, you guys are probably familiar with these um, uh, type curves on the left hand side. These are just the Van Everdeen and Hearst type curves. Uh, Fetkovich's um, contribution was to take these and recognize that the boundary stems were all on this, in, you know, all had the same shape, and he rescaled them to put them all onto the same sort of stem. That was like hugely innovative in my mind. So that allows you basically to have this set of curves which recognizes there's a single exponential depletion stem that that everything fits onto, and so what you end up with is this um, set of transient type curves based on the Van Everdeen. Van Everding and Hearst constant pressure solutions, the last space solutions way back from 1949. By the way, nobody had used those solutions to do anything of real value in the in the three decades before Fetkovich looked at them. And now he had sort of a practical way to put these in a type curve form that we could plot production data on. The next step was to take this information and uh, blend it with the ARPS empirical decline curve. So he also put those on type curves and put those together, and I'll show the short little video here. Again, you can take these curves and match, you know, put them together by the by his sort of um, ingenious scaling. He's able to put the the transient solutions, the boundary dominated solutions all together on the same plot. Uh, this was so cool, right? So that what this does is it makes production data all of a sudden take on this third dimension that it didn't have before. Production data analysis on a standard decline curve, you really can't you can get an answer, but and it's very easy, but you can't really, you don't have this sort of insight into what's going on. This uh, provides a tremendous amount of insight, it allows you to see where the transient flow is, it allows you to extract transient information, permeability and skin. It allows you to actually determine the boundaries of the reservoir with this exponential stem and do all the stuff that we did with conventional decline curves, which is get a production forecast based on a hyperbolic decline curve, uh, which is now in the type curve form. So hugely innovative. So um, about seven years later, Fekovic wrote another paper, which uh, is actually my favorite paper of his, because this is the one where he uses all of this technology to show, you know, how it can be applied to real production data. And he's got a, a, a huge number of case studies. I can't even go through all of them today. I just wanted to capture a few to show you that there was stuff going on in like the late 1980s that really most of the industry wasn't even aware of. Um, and I think one of the problems was is the barrier to entry to even do a type curve analysis in like 1987 was huge. There was no software. So you had to go and buy, you know, get from Fekovic or buy it or whatever the, the type curves. You had to plot your uh, production data on, you know, semi-transparent paper and make sure you get the scaling right and move it all around. It wasn't easy to do this. Um, the folks at Phillips Petroleum were doing this sort of as a matter of, of that, that was like a standard practice, but it didn't spread that far outside. It should have, but it, it never did. And I think the reason is the is this sort of limitation of, of capability of making this an easy sort of process. In any case, I'll go through some of these really quick. So this is a tight gas well um, extracting permeability skin and reservoir radius. 
here's another example of you got this sort of garbled production data with lots of upsets in it. And Fekovic recognized that you could use time reinitialization to sort of make that fit on the curves better. Of course, we do that more rigorously now using superposition. Um, this is a composite sort of montage of multiple fields all plotted on a tight curve. Um, I do that sort of work based on looking at Fetkovich's uh, um, uh, 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 analysis here, um, you know, to try and understand how different plays look together, how, how different uh, production data sets when you plot them together, how, you know, it gives you sort of this 30,000 foot view. So this is very useful. Um, again, this is a North Sea field analysis. So they were doing this sort of analysis on, on reservoirs all over the world, not just a conventional <clears throat> Uh, onshore North America stuff, but also uh, worldwide. Um, all right, so that's Vekovic. Let me sort of move forward now, and we're going to talk about two critical RTA innovations that happened in kind of the late 80s, early 90s. Um, the first one, and I mentioned this before, is the ability to reconcile the gas material balance with the existing analytical production models. This may sound sort of simple to us now, but um, even when I started my career, there was no way to use an analytical model to do a gas production forecast accurately. And the reason was, is the assumptions for the, for the type curves for the analytical solutions were constant compressibility. And of course, gas has highly non-linear compressibility and, and the, the gas material balance equation reflects that, right? And, and making those two fit together was not easy to do. Um, it was an iterative process. It was dirty. It was, it was difficult. When you're trying to do it by hand, almost impossible. So um, this innovation really get the, the people that get credit for this are Blassen Game and then standing on the shoulders of Frame and Wattenberger, who in the late 1980s developed this pseudo time concept, which effectively solved this problem. And it was kind of a messy solution. It's, it's complex and iterative. You can't just get the answer. You have to use iterations. So it's an ideal application for software. And Blasting Game was one of the first to come forward and say, hey, we've got this little gas valve. Uh, you know, it's an academic program. It's really not suitable for wide commercial application. But it was one of the first times software was introduced to solve a analytical you know, well performance problem. And it was absolutely required. Without this, we wouldn't be able to move to where we are today. The second innovation was the recognition of rate pressure equivalency. So this is this whole idea of using material balance time to take variable rate, variable pressure data and turn it into an equivalent constant rate solution. Fetkovich was almost there and he didn't quite do that. He didn't really need to do that because in his era, there was no access to flowing pressure data. So we, you know, you, you had to sort of pick and choose data sets that were, that were uh, constant pressure. And there was a lot of them that were out there, but this enhancement allowed us to go beyond that and analyze rate restricted wells also, which was huge, very important for, um, you know, for commercial application. Um, I'll just get past that one. So that's just, this is just showing a, um, a, a quick sort of video of the gas material balance iterative nature um, along with uh, the production equation and, and commercial software has now captured that. So what I want to do now is go through kind of the early application of RTA. So we have now we've got the software, we've got access to pressure, we've got the methodology. There was a simplified workflow. What I'm going to tell you is that from the years of like 2002 to 2006, 95 probably plus percent of rate transient analysis that was done was done on gas. And that was because the, the gas prices were high. It's sort of the golden age of natural gas in the petroleum industry. There were oil wells that were out there, obviously, but most of especially where I lived in uh, Western Canada, Western Canadian sedimentary basin, like 90, 95% of new wells that were drilled were gas wells. And so we wanted to understand those gas wells. And it was very simple. The outcomes we were looking for was more accurate reserves, better forecasts for rate restricted wells, identification of, of drainage size for drainage area studies and spacing studies, and recognizing interference. And then identification of water influx was another, another kind of interesting one for some of the water drive systems. So I'll show you a few examples of these. The first one is a choked gas well forecast. Um, now the sort of uh, interesting thing that happens here is you get you get lulled into sort of this idea that you see a decline here and you can forecast that and get your six BCF. The problem with this specific well is, as you can see now, is that it's highly rate restricted, right? You don't see it necessarily here, 
But definitely here you see, okay, well, they've opened up the choker, they've dropped the pressure or something. So now this well is kind of on a different decline. And then certainly once you get to about this point in time, you now you've got flat production. This is a little bit unusual, but it definitely illustrates the value of, of needing something more than just a decline curve, which is, you know, it giving you a different answer. Um, uh, every time and when you get, you know, to the end here, you know, is the six BCF. Well, maybe maybe that makes sense as a conservative uh, result. But if we take all that data, rate pressure, properly superpose it, put it on a tight curve, we can get uh, an interpretation of original gas in place. That's 10 BCF. I can then take and do a production forecast on that. I get eight and a half BCF. Um, conventional uh, decline curve analysis only gave six BCF. So the, the moral of the story here is, um, you know, this is an, uh, an EMP that's looking at um, divesting of this property in this well is one of the wells. Well, RTA was a great tool to show additional value, reserve value that wouldn't have been recognized by a conventional uh, evaluation. Now that goes both ways, right? Um, ha you know, some of those give you better answers. Sometimes uh, decline curve analysis would show you an answer that's too high. That I can show you uh, lots of examples of that as well. Uh, the next one I want to show is this concept of reservoir drainage and interference. So this is this is when we really started to get like tight gas uh, production operators going after tight gas. Uh, still vertical wells, very simple sort of geometry, but vertical wells fractured. And uh, what we're looking at here is the um, is a reservoir pool or group. Again, this is in Alberta, and um, we've got two wells that are on production, but one comes on later. So. What we're going to see here in the blasting game tight curve plot is a very clear indication of interference. When the second well comes on production, um, the production from the first well, so this is the production response from the well it was on first, um, shows this interference response. And, and that's something that can be easily um, identified on these on these tight curve plots. And then we can use uh, work that was done by blasting game and some of his colleagues to correct it using a total aggregate material balance time function and come up with the original gas in place for the entire grouping, for the entire pool. And so uh, what we end up with is this sort of much clearer subsurface picture of what's going on here. This well was drilled definitely within the region of influence of the first well, and there's going to be some sort of battle for reserves here. Now, both of these wells are operated by the same um, EMP company, but they had a sort of legitimate question at the onset of this is like, well, how should we develop this field? Should we be drilling? Should we be thinking about, you know, one of these wells per you know section or whatever that this is into section but this is uh this is in the nts system you know what should our what should our proper spacing here and i think this should be here and this shows very clearly you you should be spacing them wider because we're seeing much further than we thought uh next example i want to show and i mentioned water influx this is a really important problem to solve in the deep water gulf of mexico uh and um what tends to happen in these reservoirs is you get, you know, it's sort of a crapshoot in terms of uh, um, these, you know, these salt domes. You're not sure. Some of them are going to be volumetric and depletion drive, and some of them are going to be water influx, and it's not always clear which ones are which. And this was a um, conventional P over Z analysis that was done by an evaluator that came up with the um, uh, a uh, OJET original gas in place of 21 BCF and booked basically based on an 80% recovery factor, booked just short of 17 BCF for reserves. And I don't think you could blame the person for doing it this way. This sort of makes sense. It looks like a straight line analysis, looks like a volumetric reservoir, everything looks great. But we got a hold of this data and put it on, a, again, a set of type curves. These are blasting game type curves, just volumetric um, boundary dominated flow shown here in the, in the solid stem here. And what we can see very clearly, this is like the antithesis of interference, right? It's, it's the data comes up off the curve. This is a very strong indication of pressure support. So the pressure support is most likely caused by this water influx. We didn't know that for sure, but that's a reasonable um, projection given that what, what we see here, and we had access to some some other production data sets where the well where the well had watered out. So um, our interpretation here, using a water drive model to match the data, is a much smaller, in fact, almost 50% of the original gas in place, and the, and the high probability that this well is going to water out. And as we can see from um, this was the data set that I originally used to analyze this well. Uh, what happened later is the well indeed did uh, water out and only recovered 8.4 BCF. So the original interpretation of um, 
of you know 17 BCF for recoverable reserves was was about 50 or it was about 100 too high, and so um, uh, you know RTA can be used as an early identifier of some of these future problems, especially when it comes to water influx on a, on a gas reservoir. By the way, this doesn't work as well for oil because oil and water mobility are almost the same, but it works great for gas because the mobility ratio is so uh, uh, there's such a difference in mobility in an order of like 50 times just because of the viscosities that as a pressure transient, you can see it very clearly. It's a very clear distinguishing indicator. OK, so let's move forward. Um, now we get into the age of tight and shale gas. This starts to happen in two, 2006. This is where gas prices are great. Um, operators are out there drilling, you know, successively lower and lower permeability systems. And we're starting to see the emergence of uh, shale plays like the Barnett Shale, the Haynesville Shale, the Fayetteville Shale. Mostly still vertical wells, though. I'm going to say this is still probably 90% vertical wells. There are some horizontal wells. Obviously, um, directional drilling and horizontal well drilling was, you know, um, was was decades before that. But as far as like common practice and and common sort of mo in the industry, that it, most operators were still drilling vertical wells at that point. So we basically had two models we were using at this time, limited drainage systems and linear flow systems. And again, we were leaning really heavily, really strongly on tight curves to solve these problems. So here's just some quick examples. Um, this is one where we started to really see this effect of limited drainage and tight gas. Uh, this is uh, West Louisiana field. The well spacing here is 80 acres, which is important because you can see this well and it's only draining 15 acres. It's clearly in boundary dominated flow but it's only seeing 15 acres. So why is that the case? And is that an indication of something larger? Well, maybe one well doesn't, you know, make a story for you, but if you look at, you know, analyzing um, hundreds of wells, which we did, I'm not sure how many this is altogether, but it's, you know, it's in the double digits. Uh, we see very clearly that the median performance or the median boundary dominated flow size is less than 20 acres. So it's between 10 and 20 acres and yet we're draining uh, 80. So what's the explanation for this? Well, this is where we started to really um, come up with these mental models that are saying, well, maybe the fractures are creating the drainage volume, or maybe you have these lenticular sands that just don't have continuity in the reservoir. So lots of examples that sort of follow from that. This is a shale gas example. Um, this is a, an, an example of an implementation of the elliptical flow type curves, which are really cool. They work really well for, for vertical wells that are fractured uh, gas um, typically. So you can see a lot from this, right? You can get the, the aspect ratio of the drainage as well as permeability and XF. Um, these are finite, uh, finite connectivity fracture type, type curves. So you can determine the dimensionless fracture connectivity as well as the total uh, gas in place volume. Um, here's an example of infinite acting linear flow. Here's an example of bilinear flow. This wasn't uh, very common but we did see it from time to time. This is a Piedmont Basin well with one year of production data. So you can see clearly a, a bilinear flow response and then followed by boundary dominated flow. Um, and then uh, the, the linear flow systems, uh, Wattenberg and his colleagues did a lot of work uh, with this in like the late 1990s, uh, specifically designed for tight gas. So, so this model I call the bounded linear flow model, and it became really, really useful later on with the advent of uh, horizontal wells, compartmentalized horizontal wells with multiple fractures, uh, a great model for that as well. But we used it also for vertical wells. And so this is an implementation of this for a vertical well. Uh, we can determine, again, permeability, fracture length, uh, interpreted gas in place. Um, last but not least, this was a really cool one. And you, these are sort of like unicorns, right? You don't see very many of these. This is a tight gas, example of tight gas of a horizontal open hole well drilled. So no uh, hydraulic fractures, no, you know, just completely open hole. The advantage of doing something like this from an analyst perspective is you can see the linear flow followed by the pseudo radio flow. It's a sort of a quiet completion. You can see everything. You can see what the reservoir really looks like before you get in there and put these huge fractures in there. Um, you really don't see too many of these nowadays. And, and the reason is more pragmatic than anything else. If you drilled a well like this in the Eagleford or the Marcellus and turn the valve, nothing would come out, right? The permeability is too low. So this only works if you have reasonably good permeability. But um, if you can get a hold of data sets like this, it, it's going to tell you stuff that you'll never get from analyzing multi-fract horizontal wells. So it's sort of a shame that these are sort of disappearing, unfortunately. 
Um, all right, now we get to 2010. Um, so the interesting thing, lots of stuff happened right around this time. Of course, in 2008, we had the global financial crisis and basically a collapse in historic in in, um, in natural gas prices, which didn't fully recover until just you know a year ago or so. You know, this sort of suppressed gas price for a long period of time after that. So what the industry did, of course, is it responded by starting to go after liquids rich, um, mostly oil, uh, sometimes rich gas condensates as well. And they were just flaring the gas. The gas was not worth very much. So we're just basically we're, we're all consumed now with the oil. The other thing that happened at exactly the same time with sort of the same time scale along the same trend was we went from looking at 90% vertical wells, 10% horizontal wells to the exact reverse. So after 2010, operators were getting in there. That's the shale boom. It was all horizontal multi-stage. Like overnight, it seemed almost we went from a case where we were looking at vertical wells fractured. Now we're looking at horizontal wells multi-fractured. Um, the, the problem with that is like everything is so much more complex, right? It's so much more difficult to understand. You've got complex geometry combined or layered in with this aspect of having multi-phase flow, which makes things very difficult as well. So things got went from relatively easy to really, really hard <laughs> uh, almost overnight. So that was kind of an interesting time. And one thing I did is I, I, I wanted to sort of have a graphic that proved this or, or had sort of showed some evidence to this. And so I went through the one Petro and, and year by year, I just hanged it and I said, I find RTA is a keyword in papers submitted. And you can see uh, it just exploding after about 2010. And I attribute a lot of this to just there was a demand to understand uh, directional uh, drilling, horizontal wells, the completion technology with mul multiple fracks, the liquids rich aspect, the high pressure, high temperature environment. These were all, you know, practical engineering problems that had to be solved. Operators needed to understand this stuff. So there was a ton of, of work done uh, over the past 10 years to try and solve these problems. Um, also, um, you know, if you overlay the U.S. domestic oil production curve over top of that, you see they fit together really nicely. So this just basically says, OK, we're doing more RTA. We're doing more advanced production data analysis, trying to understand this stuff, because very simply, there are more wells producing more oil than we've ever had before. And we need to understand all this stuff. So all the operators were doing this. Um, experts started to emerge within the operator companies as well as um, uh, the uh, the service companies. So, you know, the past 10 years have been absolutely fantastic for just practical advancements in the science of production data analysis. And there's been huge things that, that have come as a result. Um, and I'll talk about a few of these right now. Um, I thought, you know, one of the thoughts I had was like, I want to sort of go through, you know, individual personalities and talk. And I just realized when I wanted to do that, I'm like, it's just too much. So I'm not going to mention any names because I don't want to leave anybody out, but there is a lot of contributors to this science and people that have done some really good work. And uh, I just, you know, in this context, I just don't have enough time to go through all of it. But I'll summarize some of the things that have happened in the last 10 years to really make uh, take RTA to the next level. Um, straight line correction methods for multi-phase flow, stress dependent permeability, numerical model based RTA methods, uh, type curves for multi fract horizontal models, enhanced history match models, including things like trilinear flow, enhanced fracture region models, not to mention just the advent of fast practical numerical models, which we never had before. Um, alternative fluid flow models like anomalous diffusion, um, probabilistic RTA methods to handle uncertainty. You know, we're dealing with these much more complex uh, uh, type geometries and much more complex uh, PVT and and having to deal with, uh, you know, um, uh, multi-phase flow and all, all these things contribute to the fact that we're just not as certain about the outcome anymore. So probabilistic models help handle that. And then finally, you know, the integration of RTA with other oil field and surveillance data and models such as micro and flow back geo geochemistry fiber, all of these things became really, uh, uh, it have happened really in the last five to 10 years and have really helped advance the science. So um, for my sort of last third, <laughs> I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the you know um, examples. And I've got, I mean, I've got so many studies I've done over the past 10 years. It was difficult to sort of pick which ones really show the milestones. But um, I'm going to say probably the most important transition of like why folks were using production data and, and RTA specifically to solve problems 
how that paradigm changed after 2010 was that now there is a reason to use production data to understand completion effectiveness. Before 2010, that didn't really matter. Completion effectiveness, who cares? I mean, the completion is you put a casing in the in the hole, you do a you know a 20 ton frac, you're not spending that much money. I mean, the res what we wanted to understand was the reservoir. But now, you know, after 2010, it's like, no, 50% of the DNC cost or or more, we're talking multi-million dollars is now hinged on that completion and that stimulation. And so that becomes a really important component. Companies are spending money on it. They want to understand it. So RTA has now been co-opted to solve the problem of completion effectiveness and fracture characterization. Whereas before it was used primarily as a, as a stop gap or a, you know, an, an underpinning for understanding reserves. So that was really a transition that occurred around 2010. So here's an example of a, you know, as completed, there's a history match. And it's a quantification of completion effectiveness. There's multiple ways to do this, but this is just one example where we go back and say, okay, if I have a well that looks like this, what would it look like if I took all those fractures out and uh, generated a synthetic production response? And then if I take a time period that we can all agree on, let's say six months, um, I can actually quantify that. So I've got 129,000 barrels that the well actually produced. If it didn't have that completion, it's it, then it only produced it would, only would have made eighty seven thousand. Okay, and this is for a Bakken example. If I if I do this exercise in the Eagleford, it's it, you know rather than one point five times improvement, it's more like a hundred times improvement. So the completion effectiveness goes up exponentially as permeability starts to go down. Uh, it's an important uh, realization as well. Um, some other stuff that we did uh, is just fracture characterization in general. So this idea of um, pl plotting multiple results on a graph, this is fracture area plotted as a function of drainage area. What we're really trying to understand is, is there a, um, a clustering that we can see where certain plays are behaving certain ways? And this is the result of a lot of RTA work done in different basins. And what you can see is there's a definitive difference in an ultra low perm system like Eagleford as opposed to Bakken. And uh, Bakken, you can call maybe low fracture density. Eagleford, you can call very high fracture density as a result of this. And so how are we getting all these individual points? We're, well, we're using um, really basic standard sort of RTA practice from 2010 going forward, which uh, um, I wrote a paper back in 2010 sort of detailing this workflow where you would use a flowing material balance to establish that stimulated reservoir volume and, and, uh, and uh, respective drainage area. And also uh, using a square root time plot, get the A root K from the slope of that, which is going to give us our cross-sectional um, fracture area. So, so all of these points is just the results of, of doing this exercise for you know hundreds, in this case, I don't know, 50 or 60 wells. But of course, we've done this for thousands of wells now and trying to understand this fracture characterization, trying to, trying to understand this behavior on a global sort of level. Um, here's another example of completion effectiveness, just, just looking specifically at cluster spacing and showing that cluster, as cluster spacing increases, we're actually getting a degradation of EUR normalized by 1,000 feet of lateral. So that's for a study that I did very recently. Um, and then the last one I want to show you is an integrated microseismic RTA study that was done. I thought this one was really, really interesting. Uh, we did a per tech paper on this. Um, and... Uh, uh, partnered up with uh, with ESG, which is a microseismic mapping company, and used some production data from uh, an operator in the Duvernay to try and basically solve the problem of uncertainty in um, fracture characterization. And it turns out that microseismic and production data and RTA have a really um, have very narrow overlap. So they're very nice complementary tools. RTA is really good for giving you the volume, the the in place volume or stimulated reservoir volume and not very good at showing you how it's distributed. So putting these two together can really solve that problem a lot better. So we were able to sort of infer uh, just a basic RTA on its own is going to give you this sort of um, very simple interpretation. The dynamic parameters analysis from the microseismic gives us a much more complex distribution, and we can use that complex distribution to shape our RTA model and get a better result. So. Um, you guys have probably no been noticing I've been talking real fast because I've got so much to say in a short period of time. So we're almost at the end. I'm going to just go through some quick observations. 
which I think um, summarize sort of what we've seen over the last 20 years. Um, and what I'm going to say is that um, one of the main things I've seen really evolve in, in the most recent uh, you know, few years of RTA is ENPs with asset team organizational structure have embraced RTA as a common framework for interdisciplinary planning and strategy. That's huge, right? The idea that RTA can be a, and production data analysis in general, just understanding well performance <clears throat> and the terminology that surrounds it, using RTA outputs as objective functions to solve problems of completion optimization while spacing optimi optimization. That's huge now. Um, back in the early days, that wasn't really a thing. We were just, you know, looking at wells individually. But, you know, RTA has become less intuitive as reservoirs become more complex. That's sort of a downside to all of this. Um, our ability to really sort of see a, a, a well performance signature, signature and say, okay, well, that's boundary dominant flow. The, mud, the, the waters are muddied now. It's, it's much more difficult to really see these transitions very clearly. And so that can, be, can become a problem. Um, better software and improved computational efficiency has made uh, analysis easier and faster. Um, and engineers are absolutely for sure analyzing more data, but they're not learning as much as, as they used to. So I'm going to use this now as an opportunity to do a quick plug of our platform, the Savio Learning Platform. And uh, I've given you a little bit of a taste of sort of the history of RTA. There's lots of um, material in here on production data analysis, rate transit analysis, many, many other things as well. In fact, what you're going to see here in a minute is our friend Matthias Carlson, who has his own course from Whitson, and uh, that's uh, on our uh, Savio platform as well. So, you know, we have these um, available to access, you know, on-demand training. You can uh, learn at your own pace or in a group setting. Um, there's, you're going to see Tia's handsome face here in a minute. Um, you get access to all of these industry experts, uh, instructor-led Q&A, online collaboration between subscribers and energy experts. Um, the content is bundled. Um, you have access to all of this stuff. We have something like 28 courses on there now. We're planning on putting um, another, we're going to double that uh, by the end of 2023. So we're just in content creation mode right now, putting lots of stuff on there for one single price. You know, you can access all this stuff and it's always up to date, relevant materials. So we're always putting the latest stuff on there. Our instructors are incentivized to keep this content current and um, all the materials are vetted by a steering committee. So that is the SOG platform. Uh, thank you for allowing me to do that uh, quick plug. <laughs> And uh, just, you know, a couple of sort of last comments for this, you know, what's what's next for for this science for, of RTA? Well, um, I see something that, <clears throat> something that I really like, which is the resurgence of the natural gas market. Um, a lot of these techniques were originally designed to work for natural gas. That's where they work the best. So now that gas prices are coming back up, we have a, an application which are, you know, type curve matching and uh, it's a lot of the RTA methodologies are really designed for. Digital, digitalization is huge, of course. Data-driven models, are they going to replace uh, or complement physics-based? Um, that's already happening. Are we going to see well-performance analysis by AI? Probably, uh, if we haven't already. Um, reservoir engineering will continue to evolve to fit the needs of the industry, um, but fundamentals will always be important, and I'll always stand by that statement. So with that, I will say thank you very much, and. Matthias, thank you for letting me go a couple minutes over. Hopefully we still have uh, some people on the call and I'm happy to answer any uh, any questions. Yeah, 100%. No, great. Uh, and thanks again, Dave. Um, we have a few questions here. I got a few ones, personal ones in the chat. Uh, just because of the time, we'll probably limit it to a couple of uh, questions. There's one uh, one question from the chat here. Uh, could, you, could you speak to the challenges of generating full lifecycle forecasts from only transient flow data? So um, we're basically predicting uh, something that will happen eventually. Uh, yeah. To to no, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, that's that was sort of the first requirement in my mind for for probabilistic models, and we saw a lot of that kind of in the early two thousands, where tight tight gas is where you tend to see lots of transient data, right? Because you just have a, a single vertical well and a fracture. And it's sort of out there. It might be a hold by production well. And if it's a vertical well, you could. I mean, I've seen some of these wells that have 10 or 20 years of transient production. So it makes it really difficult to put a, you know, a constraint on what that well is going to do. And I think the only way to answer that question is to 
do it probabilistically, like to say, okay, I, if I'll come up with a P90, P50, and maybe P10. Um, if you've seen all the boundaries, of course, the need to do that starts to go away because you have much more confidence in the result, and then uncertainty window really starts to narrow. But um, yeah, I think hopefully I answered the question there. Yeah, great. Uh, the other thing we talked a little bit about is like learning and RTA. Uh, from your perspective, who did you learn uh, RTA from from the first time, and what would you kind of recommend uh, as a first step for engineers that maybe just started in the industry and they would like to dip their toes uh, uh, into this field? So, to be honest with you, a lot of it I sort of made up as I went along because you have to understand when I started my career, there was there was no such thing as RTA. There was, you know, it was an obscure reference in a few papers that academics were doing. Now I was really lucky that I had uh, I had a direct connection to these. You know, Tom Blassingame came to our office in Phuket in the late 1990s, and he worked like he spent two weeks with us, and he worked with us, and we we had this connection. We had you know people within our, our organization that were that were master's students at Texas A&M, so we were working with these folks. But we were developing the software and so one of my jobs was i had to ro road test all of this stuff so i had to look at these type curves put them in a you know get programmers to program and put them in a piece of software and try them on real production data to see if they worked and see how well they worked um, i can tell you there's no better way to learn than to do that um, but it also is very time consuming right so i understand now we're in a little bit of a different environment now there's an expectation to be much more productive but the unfortunate part of that is that you you're not going to learn as much, right? If you if your job is to analyze 300 wells in a month or 300 wells in a, a week or whatever it is, and you know these are complex multi fract horizontal wells and it's complex PVT and three phase flow, like good luck, you're not going to you know you might get you might have really nice software to do it and history match and everything, but you're not really going to learn the fundamentals by doing that. So you have to, I think, in my mind, you have to take the time and you have to really go back and and look at some of these uh, original methods to try and understand what people were doing with them. Yeah, it reminds me of actually one of uh, Mike Kletkovich's famous quotes, uh, I can't learn f uh, for you. And uh, the yeah. same thing, yeah, probably applicable to everything, but especially yeah. also RTA, okay. uh, 100%. The, um, the last question we'll do uh, is from uh, Kurt, uh, and then we'll close the, uh, the webinar today. Uh, but his question is basically, what are you most excited about when it comes to new possible frontier in RTA? So basically either a new application or or a methodol uh, methodology that has changed. Yeah, no, great question. Um, I, I love the idea of just making things easier. Uh, that's because what I've seen in my career is people will just not, they're not going to, you can have something that's like really clever and really innovative if it's not easy for them to apply in their in their actual job, they're, they're not going to use it, right? And we have, we, and I, I've been involved in software development where I thought, you know, I created this sort of idea or concept, and I've got a couple of examples of this, and I thought, man, this is going to make me famous, this is awesome, and um, everyone's going to do this. And then we put it in the software, and like literally nobody used it. It was like a total bomb, right? And, and so I kind of learned that the hard way. So, so my answer to the question is like, Anything that makes our jobs as petroleum engineers easy, easier is 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 something. And obviously, like it has to easier is not is not the only thing. And it it has to be valid, and it has to lead to better decisions and all that kind of stuff as well. But um, we want to look for technologies that allow us to do our jobs. You know, to to spend time doing what we do best, which is making good decisions and exercising judgment. So the, the sorts of technologies like data-driven analysis, AI, I'm really excited about these because they can take a lot of the grunt work away from human beings and um, allow us more time to do the things that we do better, which are those higher level decision-making exercises. Um, so things that, you know, I, I heard a quote once that like petroleum engineers spend 80% of the time just moving data around and wrangling data. We still haven't solved that problem yet, right? If anything, that's even gotten worse because we're just, looking we're just moving more data around so so um technologies that allow that that save us the time in doing that are, are very exciting to me awesome so uh with that we'll uh round off today thanks for all the participants thanks again for you uh, to you dave a really good presentation learned a lot uh, amazing also got a lot of uh very nice uh comments here in the in the 
in the chat. So uh, thanks again for that. Uh, and we'll uh, be back actually next month with a, uh, another webinar. Thanks a lot. Great. Thanks, Matthias. Appreciate everybody attending. Thanks a lot.